Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I'm Fernando Guerra. I'm professor of political science and also professor of Chicano studies. I'm also director of the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Tonight, you're gonna to witness the Urban Lecture Series. This is a lecture series that's been going on here at the university for over 10 years. We bring all kinds of community, uh, business, and nonprofit individuals to come and talk to us about issues facing our city. We hope you enjoy the show today and stay tuned for a great conversation about our great city. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. This is the Urban Lecture Series. We have with us today uh, Mayor Bob Foster from the city of Long Beach. He's now currently in his second term. Uh, right. be before that, he was a, uh, a, an executive with Southern California Edison, and before that, he worked in uh, government at the state level, and he's always been involved in government in a variety of different areas, especially energy, and we're gonna talk uh, specifically by that, about that. You were in the private sector, making a lot of money, or so people tell me, I never saw your paycheck, but now I know your paycheck because it's de public. De decent money. Yeah, and then you decided to give all that up to become mayor of, of Long Beach. Why? Uh, it, was, it happened right after the aneurysm, and uh, that's a joke. Uh, apparently not. <laughs> uh, they're, they're a little slow, they just went through midterms. Yeah, you know, well, that. you know, they're in you know, private school, you know. Uh, <laughs> I should have mentioned, I didn't want to mention San Jose State where he went to that's, uh, uh, and, that, that and is, UC Davis, and that's UC right. Davis, and he's also affiliated right now as well with uh, San Jose State and their political science department. He goes up there and miseducates them every once in a while. <laughs> it, it's actually a good question. Uh, the, the short answer is I had really accomplished everything I wanted to, to, to accomplish in my private sector career. I started out uh, eons ago uh, working in the state legislature. It was really my first real job. Uh, if you don't count installing carpet through working my way through college, uh, which I did for a lot of years. And uh, uh, I, I always wanted to return to public service and I wanted to return uh, at, a, at a time when I didn't have to have the position. I didn't need the job. And uh, I love Long Beach. I've been there uh, now 17 years and I, whatever skills I've developed and leadership talents I developed, I wanted to lend them to, to, uh, to Long Beach public policy. That's why really why I did it. And it was a substantial pay cut, I will tell you that. And you mentioned um, uh, you see uh, you were getting a PhD, you did a lot of graduate work, you uh, took uh, uh, theory classes. What, if anything, about that has helped you be mayor or helped you be a CEO of Ed Edison? in that what did you learn in those type of uh, political science classes that was applicable? Uh, I, I finished all the coursework for the doctorate and then took a planned educational leave and it was so well planned I never went back. Uh, uh, I, I did specialize in political theory and how, how did that help? I, I think the best way I can describe it is that it, it really does help you parse issues pretty carefully. It also enables me to frame things pretty quickly. So it, it, it gives me a base from which I can reflect on current problems. I, I use it all the time. I used it in business. Uh, and at least for me, it's been a very helpful thing. Um, the ancient Greek I took is not too handy, but <laughs> the political theory is. So let me talk about the campaign when you first ran. We saw recently a campaign with Meg Whitman as a candidate for a governor, as a CEO. Uh, we've seen because of the fallout of 2008 and the economic crisis that the uh, perception of CEOs is not very high. But when you were running, you were running as an ex-executive, uh, as an ex-president. How did that play in the campaign? How were people responding to someone who in the private sector as the head of a corporation wanting now to be their mayor? Well, uh, apparently it worked out pretty well, but uh, uh, there was an issue in the campaign. My opponent, uh, he, you know, I, I was the point person through deregulation. I was the point person through the energy crisis. He tried to paint the Edison company as a polluter he tried to paint the Edison Company as someone who charges a lot of money for raids, et cetera. None of that really had any effect. And then he tried to indicate that as an executive, uh, you're not, that I would be ill-equipped to be in public life because I was used to ordering people around, which demonstrated to me his lack of understanding of business. And I actually said at one meeting, I said, I don't understand this. You think I sit at my desk 
with two stamps and just go, yes, no, yes, no. Because anyone who's been involved in business knows that's not how you lead. That's not how you get things done. Uh, in my entire life, in my business career, I never ordered anyone, so you will do this because... Never once? Uh, not never once. once. Never once said, you'll do this because I'm the boss. Uh, people respond to you because they trust you. And that's true in business, and it's true in government. So what's the big difference between being CEO of a private corporation and being CEO or mayor of a city? Yeah, you, you have far fewer resources in a city at your command to be, particularly in this environment. And you, things are slower. Uh, and uh, the, the only other real difference is that you, you, you have to lead people to a conclusion more so than you would in the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, people would naturally respond to you because you're the president and say, yeah, he's right, we'll go do it. Being mayor, there are some people that will do that, but you really have to work with a, particularly with the city council, and you have to bring them along on a lot of, a lot of things, and you have to also help them in certain areas. Uh, you, that dimension is in a hierarchical corporation is, is different. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, there has not been that much difference between both jobs. What's been your... Um biggest surprise about being mayor of, of Long Beach that you didn't expect and you reflect black and you think and you reflect and you think I, I never imagined that um, I, I, t I say this a lot I it really isn't anything I that I was surprised at uh, uh, in, in city government uh, with possibly one exception when I started parsing through the budget <laughs> it's gonna sound like a small thing but I realized that when we set the top step for pay in the city of Long Beach. That top step was set at the median of the 10 cities we compare ourselves to. I thought that was, it, nobody in the private sector would ever do that. And that I thought was, still doesn't make sense and to me. And pay for what, for employees? For any for job, your, any, you take your, take your list of jobs, take a, a management one, a man, you know, first level management. We would, we would have the 10 comparable cities the top step in Long Beach would be at the median mm -hmm. of the 10 comparable cities. In business, you're usually setting that top step at the 75th percentile, sometimes even a little higher. And that's because you want to be able to recruit and maintain Yeah, you, you want employees. to attract capable people. Yeah. So what's been the most frustrating thing about being mayor of Long Beach? I mean, besides getting stopped in Costco and getting asked questions every time I shot in the car. Um, let's see. The most frustrating thing. As the city council. No, no you know, I, I, you know I, 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 I get along pretty well with most people on the council. Uh, it can be frustrating. Um, I, I think the most frustrating thing for me is the, just the sheer time it takes to do things. Uh, you, you really, the time is a different dimension in government, and it's, it's not because they're slow or they don't have the intelligence or the resources. The process just takes time. And that can be very frustrating, uh, you know, you, where you could do things in the corporate world in days. It may take weeks or longer in the private se in the public sector. What's the relationship between the city of Long Beach and the city of Los Angeles? And I ask this: Is there is there a? I mean, it's Los Angeles. You know, four million people. I've heard of it. Yeah, it's you know it, you <laughs> you share a long border with them. You your harbors are right next to each other. And we constantly, because of LA is so big next to Long Beach, we don't think, we think of Long Beach as being a small city, but in reality, I tell my students all the time, it's bigger than St. Louis, Cincinnati, Louisville, Miami. Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you know, we think of those as big major cities. Well, Long Beach is bigger than all those cities. Yet, being next to Los Angeles, it has this impact of us immediately thinking about Long Beach being the stepchild in Los Angeles County as being the, the, the second tier city. Well, what's the relationship and how, how, how does that work out? Well, first of all, that does pose a problem. And particularly if you're in public life, it, 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 the consequence of that, for example, any one of those cities you saw from you know, on that list, every one of the top 10 cities in, in the state has its own TV station. Some of them have a lot of them. Bakersfield has three, for example, smaller city than Long Beach. 
has its own radio stations. You have none of those in Long Beach because you're right next to Los Angeles and TV stations that cover Los Angeles and radio stations, quote, cover Long Beach. They don't do an adequate job. And that you don't, is, you don't have a media market. We do that. not have a media market, and that's very frustrating. Uh, and, and, and as a consequence, you know, we're, all the print media in, everywhere in the country is at risk. We have a newspaper, but like every other newspaper, it's struggling. Uh, so you live in the shadow of a very large city, and, and you get overwhelmed sometimes, most of the time. Uh, however, you know, it has some benefits. I mean, you know, I, I joke around about this, that our new motto is Long Beach, we're not L.A., because it's a very livable city. Uh, if you haven't been there, a lot of people still think of it as a Navy town. It is really a, a much different place. It's reinvented itself. It went through near depression conditions in the early 90s. And today it's a vibrant community with a very large tourist and conference uh, sector in the economy, a vibrant port, just about as big as the port of LA, uh, and with a, a very large medical establishment, much larger than our numbers would warrant. It's, and much less traffic. It's a great place to live, to tell you the truth. And we're one of only three large cities in California on the Pacific Ocean. So we have a lot of advantages. So I think those are, you know, those are things you have to weigh. Quality of life, I think, pre presents a much better picture in Long Beach than most places in Los Angeles. And I think we could demonstrate that. Uh, we're you know, a built-up city, so our population is not going to grow at least too much more. Right. And we saw that in the data. That you we, saw that in the data. Grew and, one, you know, we'll have a little bit of growth. We're going up, uh, particularly down by the water. Uh, and then as far as our relationship with Los Angeles, so they come, by and large, it's a healthy relationship. Our ports on almost every issue cooperate. There are different structures in each port establishment. Uh, I've known you know, the mayor of Los Angeles for a long time. I knew him when he was Speaker of the Assembly. Uh, we have a very good relationship, a good working relationship, and not too many things that we have tension on. There are some, but not many. What are your top three priorities as mayor of Long Beach? Uh, there's still one is uh, to make sure that particularly the environment around the port is improved. We're well on our way to doing that. And uh, we've, you know, I, I won't go through chapter and verse on that, but we're two years ahead of schedule on a number of programs, the, the air quality and water quality in the port is dramatically improved. That's our obligation to people live around that and in the city. Uh, secondly is no, to- But let me stop you there. So how do you measure pollution? Or you're, you're just saying that the port creates pollution and you, you, your job is to mitigate it along with the port. Yeah. There are sensors all around the port that measure this. I mean, we are, you can also, the, the, all the, the, our entire trucks, uh, diesel truck fleet has been turned over and changed out. Both the private sector and the... All, all, there's no public sector trucks. These are all private sector trucks. So all so. the trucks that go into the port to pick up goods and all that, they cannot have Correct. diesel. Well, no, they have, they can eat, they have to be, uh, at, at the present time, they have to be a 2000 or a three or newer truck. But what happened is, as a result of standards that ratchet up, oh, I think not, 90 plus percent of the fleet now is 2000 or, and seven or newer and remarkably cleaner, uh, orders of magnitude cleaner than older trucks. Uh, ships uh, are under speed restrictions to be able to reduce particul particulates out of them. We've got electrical equipment uh, now all over the port. Ships, as they're hoteling in the harbor, uh, are gradually going on what's called coal dining. They're plugging into electricity. So there's a demonstrable reduction in pollution. The goal was to reduce pollution in five years by 50%. We're, we're just about at that number now, two years ahead of time. Was, so it, was the port the number one source of pollution in Long Beach? Yes, it was. Yeah, both trucks and ships, both, they're both about equal. Yeah. Uh, second, so that's number second. one. So the second is to provide opportunity for a particularly at-risk population. And we've done that in a variety of ways uh, uh, in terms of employment opportunity and job opportunity. And we've for major construction projects, and we have about $3 billion now in projects between the port and the airport, and all those projects carry what's called a project labor agreement, which contain in them a requirement to use uh, a significant percentage of local hires to be able to work in the port. And Meaning they have to be residents of the city of Long Beach? Or? Residents or near in the area. Uh, there's a little bit of latitude because you can't just pull everybody, but it's in the area. Uh, and 
third is related to this. I, I, one of the things that I, I ran on when I was mayor is to introduce back into the high schools uh, what would be career training. Uh, it used to be called vocational training, and it's gotten a, a very bad name, but we're not teaching young people anymore how to, the principles of architecture, of, uh, of construction, of, of you know, had, had electricity, plumbing, carpentry, what have you. And we now have a four-year curriculum at, at Jordan High School in a large at-risk community in which it's called the ACE program. And students, when they leave that program, will either go to a, they'll either go work in the trades, go to community college to get more training, or go on into engineering or architecture at, at a four-year school. And we graduated our first class a year ago. It's been very successful. And we're trying, and we're, what we've done now is to create with our Pacific Resource Center, our community college, and that ACE program, a feeder system for jobs that are going to be needed in the construction industry at the port and the airport. And you say this, though, even though the city and the mayor of Long Beach do not have formal control over the school systems. How, how are you able to accomplish this? We've got a great relationship with our school system. I, I, this is a, a very, uh, it was a pleasing story for me because when I talked during the campaign about introducing what we call this ACE program, I, I, I patterned it after a program in San Diego at Kearney High School uh, called Construction Tech. And, I, and they ran in, in that example, they ran into a, a great amount of resistance from the school district. Our, our district embraced this from day one, and, and they've been remarkable in their cooperation. And uh, we have a very good school district. It's won the Broad Award once. It's been nominated, I think, three times. Uh, it's, it's a very good district. But explain to the students that you have no formal responsibility. I do not. It's not in your budget. It's not. And I do not. And and we have, but we have a great relationship. And so you have to first do an informal sense of, uh, of building that relationship and getting and willing a school district to do something. Because at, at the end of the day, if they decided to do something else or not even follow your lead, there's nothing you can do. Well, you, uh, could, you could complain about it and make them feel bad, but that's well, about but, it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Mayor Viragosa and his attempts to influence uh, school politics. He's in the same position that you're in, mayor of a big city with a big school district that he has absolutely no control over. He tried to build a relationship. They didn't particularly go along with what he wanted to do, so he got involved in the campaigns and in the politics of running candidates who would be allied with him. Do you find yourself endorsing candidates for school board or community college board that will see and view the world a little bit more like you do? Yeah, I, I really, I really haven't had that 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 uh, that experience. I mean, the, uh, I have to tell you, the, the school board's been by and large very cooperative, and and both the community college has been a great partner. Uh, uh, we've been able to work cooperatively together without without really getting quote political. Uh, but you do endorse candidates, don't you, for other I, I do. I, if, I know, if I know people personally and I have a relationship with them uh, and there's not somebody else who I also have a relationship with them, I'll endorse candidates. I, I'm, I'm generally careful about who I endorse, but yeah, I do. Well, let, let's have that conversation because I, I, I want to run for uh, Long Beach City Council. And I come to you and I say, yeah, I'm going to run for Long Beach City Council and I, I want your support. I want you to endorse me. I, I've been watching what you do. I feel exactly the same way you do, and I would like your, your support. I, I really wouldn't want you on our council, so I'm not going <laughs> <laughs> to. Like, but you wouldn't want someone smart. It's, it's, not, it's not the way. It's not the I, I way. Part, part let, of, let me give you an example. I thought part of leadership was always trying to get someone smarter than you to work with you. Oh, I, yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, and were that were true, I would endorse you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, that's not really the way it works. Uh, let me give you an example. It, it, you know, the, the council, what will happen is quite often you'll have either someone who's an incumbent or someone who, is, you, who knows you, who wants to run. You very seldom get hit very cold where someone you don't know says, I mean, they can ask. The worst you can say is no. But generally, you really have to have a relationship with someone. And, and, and oftentimes, you'll have two friends running. And then you got a hard decision. Normally, you would stay out of a race like that. You just would. It's just, you, you, unless you, there was an overwhelming reason to, to get involved. Um, you know, you'll have 
two candidates running for a state office uh, that you know you may if you, if I have a long-standing relationship with someone and I believe that they will be a good public policy holder and be independent yeah I'll definitely consider endorsing him but I, I also like to have a conversation if I don't know them well I'll, I'll try to develop a relationship and have a long conversation and I'm careful about who I endorse I, I'm careful about that yeah, but I, we always think, you, you want allies, you want people who think like you, not only on the council, but the state legislature and in Congress that represent uh, uh, Long Beach. So how many state legislators actually represent the uh, Long Beach area? You got one, well, you've got pieces of districts. You've got, uh, by and large, Alan Lowenthal. Uh, and then who you was had, previously on the city council. Who was previously on the council. assembly member, then a state senator. You, had, you have a piece of Long Beach represented by former state senator Jenny Oropesa. And now by Ted Lou, who right. runs in that, who's running that district, they have a piece of Long Beach, and we have two. By the way, that district comes all the way up here to the border of Loyola Marymount, so that's a very mm -hmm. large district. Yeah, yeah. And we, we have, and we have two assembly, uh, uh, assembly. We have Warren for Tani has three actually. Well, Rod Wright's got a small piece of Long Beach too, so that's three. Uh, <laughs> you've got uh, Bonnie Lowenthal who. Formerly was Alan Lowenthal's wife, but no longer married. It gets complicated. And uh, uh, then you have Warren Furutani has, I think, a piece of it, and one other one, but I'll, it'll, I'll, it'll, it'll register sooner or later. So we're going to go through redistricting because we saw the new census numbers, and those census numbers then force us to redraw the lines for the Congress and for state legislature, but also for the city of Long Beach. Um, in, in principle, would you prefer to see a congressional district that's all of Long Beach, that's completely within it, or would you prefer to see three or four members of Congress have a piece of Long Beach? What, what would you prefer? That's a good question, because... That's <laughs> the only kind of questions I ask? I, you know, for politically, you'd like to see one Long Beach seat, but to be candid, I think you have more influence if you have basically two. You have a major piece of two districts. I think you have more influence. This, the commission that's dra dra you know, drawing these lines is supposed to do this by, I actually don't know what they're supposed to do, but they're supposed to do it free of worrying about incumbents and free of worrying how they draw the lines and you know, they have communities of interest and some other standards to draw lines from. So I don't know what they're going to produce, but if you ask me strictly from our perspective of what I'd like to see, I think having two members of Congress where we have a large piece of their district would be would be better for the city. Now, the city of Long Beach has to do its own lines. What's the process there and how are you involved in that? Uh, not much. Uh, you know, it's, it really is, the, it's, the council is really concerned about it. There's a committee they're using to draw the lines and I think they're looking at the existing lines. We're not subject to the commission. They, they draw their own lines. So I, I don't think you'll see too much change over the existing district. City didn't really grow or, or diminish in population much. And uh, we'll have to look at the districts and see if people moved, moved around. Uh, there will be some that gain some population. So I, 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 you know, I think that that's really, right now it's a legislative act and I really let them do it. And really your only role would be to, if it was so egregious that you would veto it. I, I think could. That's, that's your role. And then, right. and then so um, explain to the students, uh, when you veto this, tell us a story when you have vetoed things and what the process is when, when you veto things and how, the, how they could overturn it and how that works in the city of Long Beach. Well, it's different. Uh, after about, uh, within 10 months of being elected, we had a charter issue on the ballot to strengthen the mayor's office. And, Remember uh, that the charter is like the city's constitution. Correct. Uh, and previous to that, uh, the mayor had a veto, but it was a weak veto, five members could pass something and then five men members could overturn it. Uh, didn't have much in the way of removal power, yet appointment power and that, but you didn't, it was, you know, it was a pretty weak system. Uh, that changed in May of uh, 2007. Uh, the mayor now has a strong veto, it takes two thirds to override, has a line item veto on fiscal measures. Uh, I can remove people from commissions and positions uh, with the concurrence of two thirds of the council. I think that's still a good system and so it's a much stronger office as a result of that. You were mayor in both systems? I was only mayor for 10 months under the old system, but I did veto something under the, there's something to be said for uh, 
Uh, if a mayor comes, and if a mayor has any following and comes out and vetoes something, even if it only requires five votes to overturn it, council members are going to be somewhat reluctant to do that. So the first thing I vetoed was a, um, a requirement, what was this? It was a labor issue dealing with uh, uh, requiring a, uh, a labor peace agreement at hotels. It was very poorly drafted. Even if I agreed with it, it was not really enforceable. And we vetoed that, brought it back, rewrote it and strengthened it, and then uh, we're gonna put it, then again, then we're going to pass it. The opponents of that were going, actually decided they were gonna refer that in a referendum, and it wound up never being adopted. We had to have a special election for it, so it wound up never being adopted. That was the first thing I vetoed. The second thing was uh, I vetoed, uh, line item vetoed some items uh, this past year. I, th I threatened my veto a couple of times, and I don't do that lightly. Let me go, just go back to that and do them chronologically. Uh, in fact, this has to do with the city of Los Angeles. Uh, we were in the process, uh, Tony Batts is now the police chief at Oakland. He was the police chief in Long Beach. So we were doing a uh, search for a new police chief. And we have a, a city manager, city administrator, city manager in Long Beach, and again, a great relationship with him. And I, I fault myself a little bit for this too. And we had gone through a lot of difficult issues with our public safety personnel. And you know, we said, he said to me, I'd rather just do an internal search. And even against my, probably the gnawing thing in the back of my head, I said, I don't know, yeah, I should have said I don't know, but I agreed with him. So then of course what happened is the search firm doing the search, looking at either internal candidates or people that had worked at the city of Long Beach. Uh, at the same time, the city of Los Angeles selected a new chief and the number two person, Jim McDonnell, uh, was now all of a sudden became Basically. available. And our, the guy leading our search called us up and said, you, you can't rule this guy out. I mean, you've got to interview him. Maybe he's one of the top cops in the country. So we reversed course on that and as part of that, uh, our, our police officer association got upset, and some council members got upset, and they were there was a there was a real movement to either potentially give the city manager a very bad evaluation report, which was occurring right there, or potentially fire him. And so I, the council fires him, not you. The council can fire. I, I can veto it. So the council, uh, I basically you know we just made it public and said you know if there's any attempt to fire Pat West, I'll veto that over this issue. And all of a sudden there was never an attempt to fire Pat, it just, it just evaporated. And, and as it turned out, uh, Jim McDonald did go in the search, did get hired by the city of Long Beach, and he's proved to be an amazing uh, chief of police. And he lives in Long Beach, I might add, so that was uh, another factor. And then finally, this last budget cycle, I vetoed uh, a, a couple of line items. Well, some people are saying you vetoed your own budget. Uh, no, uh, not really. Uh, That's what I read in the press. And I, they well, were I don't like, believe everything you read in the press. I'm just, just, well, <laughs> I'm just saying. That's what I read. The, the budget is put together in, in Long Beach by the, city, by the city staff. I review it, and I make recommendations on it. And what ha it's, it really is sort of a, it, it's, it, it, one of those things that's evolutionary. In between the time it was adopted and the time I have for vetoing, our financial situation actually looked even much worse than I thought just three weeks before. So I vetoed 1% and put that in a reserve fund. Just took out 1% from every department to hold in reserve mm -hmm. for in case the worst happened from the state. And secondly, I vetoed uh, a new administration building that the port was proposing for about $300 million, which I really thought was... Yeah, that's an, port in, in money. That's not in the general fund. Why? Money's, as far as I'm concerned, money's money, and the, let me explain, explain that. I'll yeah, explain yeah, that. I, wanna, I want you to also explain within your answer the, diff, the how the port has a different budget and almost a different system. It does. It's not a, it's not, it doesn't come from the general fund. Yeah, Los Angeles has a similar issue. You have, uh, you have what you call enterprise funds, and there are things like the port. Long Beach has its own gas department. It's one of the only sitting, maybe one other in California, has its own gas distribution department. Uh, its own water department and our refuse. Those four are really separate funds. They're designed to be run like businesses. 
and the they are they have they have boards which I appoint, uh, and those boards are supposed to provide the policy oversight and the sort of the board of directors for those enterprise funds. However, their budgets all flow through the city of Long Beach, and there's a reason in the they charter. They all flow. They, they don't get commingled. No, but the, no, those funds are completely separate. They don't add anything to the general fund. With uh, those those four I mentioned provide no support to the general fund by, by charter, but the, the budgets have to be approved by the mayor and the city council. Okay, but then why couldn't we use, not, not that I'm from Long Beach, but why, if I'm in the city of Long Beach, would I not want the port that does tend to pollute, that is using all kinds of resources, the name of Long Beach, et cetera, for them to build a building that the rest of the city could use as well? That's not what they were doing. Uh, first of all, you cannot use any port money for general city purposes. The port is a steward, and so is the city of what's called the Tidelands Trust. It's a state trust. The port runs that in effect on behalf of the people of California, and you cannot use that money for things in Long Beach. What the port had proposed is a $300 million and, and uh, this is probably about eleven or twelve hundred dollars a square foot, pretty expensive stuff in the port area, which I can see from my office. It's not like Los Angeles where the port's way down at San Pedro and you're down in. But were you just jealous that they were going to get a new building? Well, that was most of it. Yeah, that was really most of it. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean the truth is, uh, here's here's. I think you have to display fiscal discipline, no matter where it is, just because. It's quote their money. It's but still they public have the money. money, though. The port is very yeah, successful. They, they, two, two, they, they have money. Two things. First of all, it was a very expensive building, and you know the port was constantly telling us that well we can't fund a Tidelands project, a project in the Tidelands, uh, because you know we have to be careful with our money. And I said, wait a minute, you're going to spend three hundred million dollars on an administration building. Secondly, I think that's the wrong location for that building. I think you need to move it. I think you'd be better off looking, at least looking at space in the downtown of Long Beach, which you can see, literally you can walk it uh, uh, to the port, and you'll get less expensive space. Every, every dollar counts because you have enormous construction projects in the port that they're, for example, at this point they were trying to fund the Gerald Desmond Bridge, the replacement for it. And they're, they're looking all around for money. They're trying to fill up you know, money from the federal government, money from the state government, bonds, and everything else. And at the time, it, was, it wasn't clear we'd have adequate funding for it. Well, you don't go spend $300 million on an administration building when, you're, when the, the most important piece of infrastructure for the port to operate is in jeopardy of failing. So that's why that veto was there. So, and actually, I think it's, it's going to bear fruit. I think they're going to have alternate office <coughs> space that would be better for them and better for the city. So uh, it gets complicated. So the yes, city of Long Beach owns the port of Long Beach. The city of Los Angeles owns the port of Los Angeles. As successful as those two ports can be, and we oftentimes talk about, hey, let's have government run like a business. So let's run these two beautiful ports, very successful ports, like a business, make money, and have the money go to the citizens of Long Beach in the form of better police, better buildings, why not? Uh, I would love to do that, Fernando. I would just love to do that, but that, that violates the Tidelands Trust, and we are stewards of the Tidelands Trust. Yeah, now, that's a law. Now, Long Beach, I mean, Los Angeles tried to do this, I think, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, and was sued and lost. It actually tried to make a transfer uh, from the port to the city, much like DWP mm -hmm. makes a huge transfer every year, and they were and they were overruled in court. Uh, I think it went all the way to the state supreme court. So you, I take that seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are stewards of that Tidelands Trust. We can only spend Tidelands money, and that includes money made from the port for Tidelands purposes, and those purposes are obviously marine uh, shipping, education, environmental improvement, cleanup and recreation. Those are the things you can spend money for in the Thailand Trust. And, and to be candid, we've got more projects lined up that have to be done than we have resources for. So uh, Under those areas? Under those talking. areas. Now, it'd be great if you say, well, you know, we'd like to be able to fund police and fire. Now, they do pay for 
police and fire services, but those are only compensatory. We can't, there's no, they, we don't, they don't pay for police on the north side of town. They pay for police services. So they don't have their the own port. police department? They, they do. They have, they, have, they have a harbor patrol, and they work in conjunction with us. Uh, we're looking at if that's still the best way to do things, but they have their own harbor patrol. So I guess what I'm getting at is more of a, a, of a theoretical or principled thing because not only the Long Beach Port and the Long Beach, um, excuse, uh, Long Beach Port and the city port, but also LAX and maybe your airport are also prohibited from, in a sense, making money and Same transferring thing. it over. But it's really a, a law, and it would be, it's my opinion that it is the airlines which have, uh, have lobbied the Congress to pass that federal law that prohibits the cities from doing that, and that it's the shippers and others at the port level that have maintained that Tidelands law. It's just a law. We could change that. And that I think we should change that given the burden that the city of Long Beach and the city of Los Angeles have in terms of these ports, that they ought to be able to transfer some to the general fund. Now, fiscally, you also understand that once you get that money, you're not going to make some of these cuts and it would just be into a black hole. But uh, from a principal perspective, the city, own, I, I know you say the city owns the port in trust, but it's the city that has really built it up and, and, and made it what it is. It should bear well, the, the fruit I, of Actually, that. the state actually owns that, owns the Tidelands area. So it, it's different for the airports, that's federal jurisdiction, but it, the, the state is the, and as I said, we're stewards of that Tidelands trust policy, but the state really owns it. The state could, in fact, there was an attempt I think about eight years ago, for the states to take these ports, which I think would be a very destructive thing. Uh, look, I, I don't disagree, and I, I, I do agree that there are impacts that are associated with the ports that cities have to bear. But the other side of the ledger, there's also 30,000 jobs uh, right in and around Long Beach that are created at that port. So there, you do have some pluses on, 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 on the ledger as well. And if the port were not doing a very good job in terms of cleaning up and, and, and what and does to impact the, the city, I, I would probably feel more, you know, more urgency to do something here, but they've done a good job. We are at Loyola Marymount University having a conversation with uh, Mayor Bob Foster, the city of Long Beach. Uh, we have another guest that's going to join us, and we're going to have her come in here, and we're going to introduce her in, in, in a second. Um, it, this is uh, Councilwoman uh, Jan Perry, and she's uh, been on the city council for about uh, 10 years, and she's also been uh, very instrumental in uh, leading with the, the DWP. Councilwoman, how are you? Fine, how are you? So you've been on the council now for 10 years. 2001. All right. And you've just announced that you're running for mayor. Yes. Uh, why, do you want to, why do you want to be mayor? Uh, I think that the greatest opportunity is when you have uh, one direction to go and that's up. And I think that we are battling our way out of a recession and we have a lot of complex challenges, but we have a great amount of resources to overcome that. We just passed uh, in council today uh, the approval of a development agreement for another large hotel called the Wilshire Grand, which will demolish and then build a new hotel with some housing, some high rises, uh, and um, create a, our own stimulus package right here locally without federal funds, just by sheer investment and uh, working within our own municipal finance uh, principles of taking a transit occupancy tax and capturing it within the area where the development will take place. And, out of that, we'll have 9,700 net new jobs. Uh, Mayor Foster, in preparing for this conversation with you, I've you know, talked to a lot of people and mentioned your name. And uh, invariably, people talked about you being one of the top one or two mayors in California. And they talked about how you approach uh, city government. They also talked quite a bit about your um, private sector uh, background and your, and your ability and understanding of issues such as, uh, such as energy. Um, I know there's no way you're going to get involved in the mayor's uh, race in Los Angeles, uh, no, knowing That's you. That's a good bet. Yeah. <laughs> but what advice do you give when people come to talk to you and they say, hey, I want to run for mayor, not of Long Beach, but of you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Fresno, Sacramento, Oakland, and, and they come and say, you know, you, you've been doing this, you, 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 you know, why, what are some of the issues that mayors face and that mayoral candidates should know about? 
Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I, I do get asked that a lot. And for the first thing I tell people is, first of all, make sure you want to do this. This is a, a, a you know, 24 seven job. You really- But let me, what did your wife say when you told her you were gonna run for mayor? Uh, she's still my wife, so we're- <laughs> uh, uh, Actually, she was uh, fully engaged in that. She, she's been a, actually an exemplary first lady. She's very involved in mental health issues and been a terrific asset. So she's, this is a real partnership and she was, she was completely supportive of it and enthusiastic about because it, when it. You still is. When you said you gotta completely be engaged in this, the first thing I thought about is you gotta get your family behind yeah, you. I you, mean, you there's there's, there's really tension within family. Not really behind you. Well, my kids are grown, so I, and I, I think that's another issue. You really- Well, you trying to tell us your kids voted against you? No, no, they don't, they don't live, no. They, well, maybe they did, I don't know. You know that's why they put <laughs> doors on, ball, on, on, on balloting, voting, voting places. Uh, I, I think you have to realize that you, you're, you really are gonna be 24 seven, it's, it's not something you can walk away from. Your weekends, you asked me about the difference between the private sector and the public sector. One of the big differences is before I could work 14 hour days and I was okay with that. But I generally had my weekends to myself, not always, I mean, the energy crisis notwithstanding where we didn't have any weekend, but generally had your weekends to yourself. That is not true in public life. You're a lot of, you have to, you have to discipline yourself to block off time and say this is personal time. And I recommend that everybody do that. You cannot, otherwise, if you wanna spend 100 hours a week, the job will suck up 100 hours a week. So you need to be disciplined in taking time off. Especially during campaigning. Yeah, well, campaigning is different. You really don't have any time in campaigning, but during, when, you're, when you're actually in the position, you need to have time for yourself. You're, you'll be a better public policy and a, a person and a better representative by having some time to yourself. So I try to block off, for example, at least one weekend a month where I just, my wife and I, we just go somewhere. Uh, and, I, and I recommend people be disciplined about that. So one of the first things, which is a question that I don't like, but every time someone's gonna run for public office, almost the very first thing someone asks is, how much money do you have? How much money did you raise? How much money are you going to raise? Are you a good fundraiser? Mm -hmm. Have people been asking you? Well, let me ask you that question. Why yeah, they, people, they've been I'm asking. asking you that question. And, and the mayor gives good advice. And I think the other thing that I would add to that list is in politics today, you have to be willing to raise money. And if you're not comfortable with that, then maybe you ought to think about whether you should step into that or not, because it's a reality of the situation. How much is it going to cost to run a campaign for mayor well, in I think 2013? In, I think to be competitive, you should expect, or one would expect to have to raise over $2 million for the primary and probably about the same or more, um, you know, in the general. And I think it's an, op it's an open seat, so you would expect there may be a runoff. Uh, if there are self-funded candidates uh, in the race, uh, you have to uh, conduct some analysis about whether or not to accept matching funds in order to remain Wait a minute, competitive. $2 million, tell the students what the limits are when someone, if I want to give um, a contribution to you, how much can I give to you? Well, first I'd have to check and see if you're a registered lobbyist. <laughs> but if you did what if I What if I was a registered lobbyist? I couldn't give any money to That's you? That's correct. You cannot. But I'm a registered lobbyist. Okay, well, there you go. I, I see, I know you as professor. Uh, but um, uh, the, the contributors can only give in one Okay, so one thousand dollars per per um, request, and you said two million, mm -hmm. so that's two thousand. A lot of phone calls. So two thousand people. You have to get two thousand people at minimum mm -hmm. to give you a thousand dollars. How do you go about doing that? You do it in a number of ways. Uh, again, you have to be able. You have to love what you do. You have to have a passion for it. You have to be comfortable and secure in asking people for money. You make a lot of phone calls. <laughs> You hold a lot of events, you do a lot of outreach, and uh, you know at some point it becomes exponential uh, in its impact, and then, then you ask people in a very straightforward fashion uh, to give to your campaign. How much did you raise your first time? I raised, uh, I think, uh, about, and we had $600 limits, and we now, have, now there's 750. Uh, I raised uh, a little over 700,000 for the primary and about half a million for the general. Wow, but, but the city is like- um, One eighth the size. One, one eighth the size, so 
comparatively, it's actually a little bit more than what uh, Council Member Perry is talking I, about. I'm pretty, I, I do so how do, you, well how, how, how do you ask people for money? Give me money. That's it? <laughs> I, I can do that. No, you know, it, it is not the part of the, the of public life. You like life asking that people I, not, for money? Not particularly. Uh, I do it, and I, I'm fairly proficient at it, but you basically go to people who you have relationships with, and you say, look, this is a fact of life. You know, I need to fund a campaign. Uh, you know me. You know what I stand for. I would appreciate your support, and I need your financial support. And you try to get people not only to give you an individual check, but to tell, to, you know, to gather people of like minds to be able to help you as well. It, it, it's very hard. Now, why do people contribute? I think people contribute. You used to, for, you used to contribute when you were uh, correct, president of. Correct. Of, I, and, and why did you contribute when you were president? Of I, I think there are a lot of reasons people contribute. I think the, the I, I actually think if you are a an active citizen or an active corporation, you have a responsibility to participate. I believe that, and that means also financially. I think you give, at least I've always had kind of a, a template that says, I want someone who's going to work hard, who at least I can, I, at least is willing to listen to arguments. At least is, you know, I, I don't, we, we actually, when I was at Edison, supported a lot of people that very rarely voted for, in, in our favor but they were people who you could sit down and have a conversation or open-minded enough to at least listen. And I, and I, I think, the, for me anyway, even today, what I try to do, I try to govern as I would like to be governed. I keep that foremost in my mind. And that means I can't just sit there and be single-minded. I can't say, well, you know, I'm a Democrat, so I can't believe that. Uh, I can't say, you know, well, I'm just going to exclude that. I really try to have as kind of a, not only an open door policy, but to be pretty open to new ideas and to always be willing to question where I initially am. And if I find that in other people, I support them. I think that's what this is. It's important to do that. So clearly, the uh, um, ballot is not. It's going to be pretty crowded. I'm sure I mean, it will be. Uh, right now we have a congressional seat, the 36th congressional seat. Does that go into Long Beach a little bit? Uh, which one is it? Yeah, yes, it does. Uh, no, nah, I, think it, I, think it, I think it just misses us. I don't think you that... You have Richards. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah but th that seat is close, but I don't think it's in Long Beach. It's so close. Jane Harmon, who actually used to Correct. represent LMU until the last redistricting, so she resigned from office, and now there's going to be a special election. In that special election, we have... Um, May uh, 17th, I think. Yeah, is it. Councilwoman Janice Hahn, Secretary of State Deborah Bowen, Marcy Winogrand, who won several times, the um, mayor of Redondo Beach, and council member from Manhattan Beach, and something like 18 others. I expect when the mayor's race comes up in 2013 that it will be you, along with three or four other significant well known individuals, and about 18 mm -hmm. others. Right. Um, so who are some of those significant individuals that may be running? Well, I think you may find a couple of self-funded candidates. Uh, the controller's already filed. Uh, and that's Wendy Gruel, the controller? TV, yeah. TV talk show host has filed, and I'm the third one to file. Um, I know the council president is thinking about it, and I think that's it for now. But I expect the, I expect the list to grow. And we uh, had uh, Alex Padilla here a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and we asked him. He never said, what did he answer? Did he say yes, he was going to run for mayor? I, uh, half, of them say, half of them say that he said yes. The other half said he said maybe. So uh, I think he's pretty good at it. He probably did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, and we also, you say self-funded candidates. The name I've heard, of course, is uh, Rick Caruso, who opened up the Grove in Americana in Glendale. And actually, he's the one that redid the Marina Shopping Center, where the uh, CPK is and all that. Um, and then we've also talked about, um, uh, I can't even think of his first name, Butner. Uh, Austin. Austin, Butner. Austin Butner, who's an investment banker, and he's working for the mayor right now as deputy <laughs> mayor for $1. Um, although people don't really know him. Someone told me you get what you pay for in terms of the $1. Um, and, uh, okay. uh, I'm not sure so, what that means. So um, the, I, I just don't see a self-funded candidate doing very well. Uh, the last self-funded candidate was 1993 Mayor Reardon. Mm -hmm. okay. Mayor Reardon. The city is yeah. very different than it. Mayor than, Reardon was a unique, uh, and I actually worked for the guy who ran against him. 
Uh, so I, I kind of am very familiar with that campaign. Uh, but Mayor Reardon had been a philanthropist for most of his life, uh, had been a commissioner for the P Department of Recreation and Parks, very involved in the libraries and school development. So he was deeply uh, engaged in the civic life of our city. And he really wasn't an outsider. He had been a patron right. for many, many years. So many people knew him even before he ran for office. So I want to make a distinction between someone who's deep pockets, meaning that we're talking about someone like, well, it's Meg Whitman is completely something that's, different. That's, that's uh, you know, she is deep pocketed, obviously, and ha had a, a, a campaign that didn't go very well. Mm -hmm. But people who are willing to throw a couple of million dollars into this campaign, not a hundred million like she did. Um, and I, I want to make a distinction between someone like that and then someone that comes from the private sector, like um, uh, Mayor Foster. Did you throw some of your own money in? Oh, I contributed to my campaign, but I, I, did, I didn't and oh, probably how much? couldn't sell. Because it's public records, so I can ask you that. Uh, I, well, my wife and I wrote the check to the campaign for the maximum. Uh, my relatives did. That's, that was, was it. I, I really do think that you have to demonstrate broad support, and I, I think that's important. Uh, and, and people willing to give you financial support is part of that. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 that, that was the extent of my contribution to the campaign. So, it's, so what we expect is Councilwoman Jan Perry, Council Member uh, uh, Eric Garcetti, uh, City Controller Wendy Gruel, uh, State Senator uh, Alex Padilla, uh, LA County Supervisor Sev Yaroslavsky, um, probably uh, either uh, Rick Caruso, who was, uh, uh, the, as we said, the um, developer of the Grove, et cetera, and Austin Butner right now. Those are the, na the significant names that, that, that I've heard of. In, in a crowded field, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. Number one, you have to have the resources to be able to communicate. Okay? Number two, you have to distinguish yourself from the crowd. How are you going to do that? What's, what, when you start thinking about what's the, the strategy in terms of distinguishing yourself from that crowd that I just talked about? Well, I don't know if I'm going to divulge my whole strategy here for uh, your permanent record, but I will say this much. Why not? Because I mean, well, everything's because going to unfold. We can, to... we can talk a little bit about what I've done okay. as it gives you some glimpse into how I would uh, present myself to the voters on a citywide basis. I've represented downtown Los Angeles and South Los Angeles since 2001. And I, I felt that downtown, and I still do believe that, downtown is an engine for economic development to attract new revenue, new investment, and to bring more jobs into the basin. I, I wouldn't even argue for the region. And it's had a catalytic effect not only in downtown, but it's begun to spread south and over across the freeway, the 110, and to the east side and north. And I've been able to create more housing, many more units of permanent supportive housing for people who were formerly homeless, uh, workforce housing, uh, the transportation corridor down exposition is now being built uh, from this side of town or the, the east side of town to connect all the way out to Santa Monica. So the, the, the dreams and the aspirations that we talked about for years are finally coming to fruition and I've been involved in many of them since, actually I've been a public employee since 1990 and before that I was in the private sector. Um, but I was able to take and harness that, that planning uh, uh, ability that I had through my own education and some of my own practical experience and just bring that to life in my own district. Many people have talked about your district in a sense being two very distinct districts, the, the downtown area and then the, uh, the southern part of the district. And many people have, have, I've heard people say when we talk about districts that yours is one of the most difficult to represent, but I also think it creates great opportunities because really it's two different parts of the, of the city and in a sense you've seen yourself be successful governing two very different aspects of that. So one of the big things we're talking about obviously uh, is downtown development or redevelopment. You talked about the, 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 uh, the hotel, but we also talked about, uh, uh, we've mentioned several times in the, in, in the lecture series, the conversation about football. Mm -hmm. And I think you've been uh, named chair of the ad hoc committee to oversee uh, uh, football. So what's the likelihood that we're going to have football? <laughs> well, it's much more than football. It's the opportunity uh, to develop exhibition space. So you're for this? Yeah, I'm for this, but we're, we're just beginning the, the, the walk down the road to see if we even get there. 
uh, we are just beginning the negotiations. Our primary negotiator for the city of Los Angeles is our chief legislative analyst who interfaces directly with AEG. So the first thing that we'll do with the committee is come forward with a, a term sheet upon which we uh, will work to achieve some consensus so that everybody agrees to terms and then that, that actually kicks off the negotiations. Um, it will take us, not, not only would it bring football back to Los Angeles, which is something that uh, at first blush people think it's just about that, but it's more than that. It's to create, I think, 1.5 million square feet of exhibition space between the floor of the proposed stadium and the expansion and reconstruction of our convention center so that we can go from 15th in the country to number five in the country. And, and that you would hope and expect that along with that, more hotels would be developed to provide the adequate number of hotel rooms to support um, an enhanced convention or a robust tourism and convention uh, business. We, we are making an announcement, I think it's next week, on an extended stay hotel uh, just across from the JW Marriott. We approved this. So we're the first ones to hear that? Mm, no, sorry. Oh, okay. But, I thought you know, it was breaking close news. Close enough, maybe the third ones. But uh, it's beginning to <laughs> stimulate that kind of interest and investment. Okay, we talked at the very beginning about how large the city of Long Beach is. It's bigger than Cincinnati, Jacksonville, St. Louis, all of which have professional sports teams. Long Beach has no professional sports team. It has had in the past. I remember going to uh, the Ice Dogs who played. Well, it's like a minor league hockey team. Okay, well, I enjoyed still, it. Yeah. Um, you, you just can't have those conversations in Long Beach being right next to, I mean, being next to L.A., it always makes it difficult. But you currently are seeing this conversation about Los Angeles having a fo uh, football stadium, uh, or, um, the city of industry thinking about building a stadium. You see up in uh, San Francisco, the 49ers may move down to Santa Clara, a smaller city. Uh, Oakland, uh, they want a new stadium there or a new ballpark. Uh, San Diego, Qualcomm Stadium, the Chargers are thinking leaving because they don't have a stadium. Uh, the Sacramento Kings are going to become the Anaheim Royals of Southern California by LA or something like that will be their new name. Um, when, you, when you see all of this about, about sports and stadiums, and does that add to the quality of life of a city? Are you four cities helping these uh, sports franchises move around and uh, do what they do? I think you have to be very careful about sports franchises, uh, particularly, you, you look at football, you play, what is it, uh, 10 home games a year. Right now, two exhibition games and eight regular season games. Uh, you have other uses for the stadium, you, and, but I, I think you would need to do a very thorough analysis of how other cities have done with sports facilities, uh, what kind of public money went in, what kind of return you had. I think you have to, you know, get the stars out of your eyes, put the... Come on, don't you in. want a sports team in... in well, I sure, everybody likes a sports team. I, it'd be great, but, you know, I also have an obligation to make sure that the citizens of the, Long Beach... The Long Beach Lakers. ...get a return, the Long Beach <laughs> Lakers. Yeah, we, we've, got a, we've got a spot we could put a stadium. Uh, you know, it's... Yeah, it's, it's, already, it's yeah. coming out right now. It's already... I, I just about. think you have... I really do. I think this is where we have to be coldly analytical and not... But does it add to the quality of life, sports? I, yeah, I, uh, well, yeah, I think, I, I would say, and I'm, I'm a sports fan, I think it does add to the quality of life, but so do other things. You have competing uh, uses, so I think you have to look at that. Redevelopment. Oftentimes, Don't rede get me started. I'm going to, because uh, <laughs> redevelopment is one of the, the uh, processes that's used oftentimes for uh, helping downtown. I think Los Angeles is a good example of good redevelopment, not so good redevelopment, and many, many uh, different cities. I want you to explain to the students what's happening with redevelopment, and, and then uh, we're going to get the councilwoman to do the, the same, and where you stand on the current situation about getting rid of redevelopment agencies. Uh, first of all, do you know, what re do you know how redevelopment is funded? So, um, I think a quick a tax uh, review of that would tax be. Tax increment, basically what happens is you, I won't go into how you do it, but if you can create a redevelopment area, you have a project area, a redevelopment agency, which sometimes is synonymous with the city, sometimes, in Long Beach it's not, we have a separate redevelopment agency, from the time you create it, uh, the incremental growth in property tax in that but area. the new taxes. New taxes, you know, the increment from, well, let's say you're here, and over time, 
you have improvements. In fact, you hope you have improvements and property taxes start increasing. That increment is, goes into that redevelopment area and can be used as a funding source to issue bonds. It, I will tell you that Long Beach, which has completely transformed itself downtown, transformed itself in parts of its north area, parts of its central area, we would not have been able to do that without redevelopment. Beyond that, on a larger measure, when you step back, it's the one, probably the last remaining tool we have in California that forces public policymakers to build and plan for the future. And it is the one tool we still have left to help at-risk communities improve their area, improve their environment, and provide hope and opportunity. And, and I'm a very strong advocate of it. Now, there are abuses, and it has been abused in certain areas of the state. That would call for reform, not repeal. What has happened is, and I'm just going to be very candid, I think the state's appetite has, been, has, has grown because it has taken redevelopment funds over the past three or four years from local government. It took uh, three or four years ago, it took $330 million and said in return for that, you, by the way, the project areas have lives, uh, usually 20, 30 years. Uh, they said you could extend the project areas by one year in return for taking $330 million. Then they came back uh, the following year and took $1.7 billion over two years and said, you can extend the project areas by two years if you well, do even this. though cities establishment established them or run them, they really are a creation of the state. They are, it is, they are a creation of the state, and there are constitu constitutional provisions protecting redevelopment money for only being used for redevelopment purposes. And what's come along now is that because of the fiscal crisis of the state, the governor has decided that redevelopment needs to go. So the governor wants to get rid of them. Correct. You want to keep them. That's correct, and, and I, I want to keep it for the reasons I stated. There is very little left in this state that gives anyone a future orientation. You, you're, the, you're the beneficiaries of this, everyone in this classroom. When I think of my constituent, I think of actually somebody younger than you. I think of a 10-year-old child. And what kind of environment am, am I and my city going to contribute to that child's welfare and, in, and benefit in the future? I don't want to encumber you with debt that you don't benefit from but I want to be able to provide you with a better civic environment, more opportunity, and a better place to live. And the only tool I have really to do that right now is redevelopment. And it's going to be take, and the proposal is to take it away. The governor wants to get rid of them. You want to keep them. Well, I do want to keep them. And what gets lost in the discussion is that we already have a pass through to schools where we take net new property tax revenue or tax increment, and a percentage of that is already given to schools uh, now. But when you hear it discussed in the media and things like that, that, that never gets mentioned. What I would prefer, and I've asked uh, our city to negotiate from that standpoint, is to have a higher pass-through amount and still allow us to function at some level so that we don't totally eradicate redevelopment uh, areas. Uh, I have eight of them in my district, and you know, the mayor's absolutely right. Uh, in some of my areas that are blighted or were defined as blighted, uh, there was no investment coming in there, but once we created redevelopment areas, it attracted private money to leverage with net, uh, property tax, net new property tax or tax increment to create an investment uh, opportunity to make uh, capital improvements to build more housing with neighborhood retail on the ground floor and to create commerce in neighborhoods where there might not have otherwise been any. So if we lose that, we do lose a significant tool. But could, would I be right in characterizing redevelopment as basically taking taxes away from cities, school district, and counties so we could do economic development for it doesn't, doesn't totally take it away from schools, so that wouldn't... But it takes some. It, takes a per, it gives a percentage to schools. Well, how would you... I mean, I'm just trying to be as fair as possible for the students to the understand counties, that. The counties that don't like it because then the net new property tax revenue is captured within an area defined as a redevelopment area, and the redevelopment agency is able to govern the way that it is spent with a board of directors. That would not be correct. Okay, care. Okay, because, yes... Uh, so on the, the final short, exam, the, make sure you define it the way I do it if you want a good grade. That's right. It's short run and long term. In the short run, 
there is some there was some reduction from schools and other purposes, but but we're talking about taxes. I know, right? but yeah. Councilman but Bright, the there already is passed through even from the tax increment. There's pass throughs to schools now. If you take, if you, in the short run you might have a slight reduction because of redevelopment. If you eliminate redevelopment, and you can look all over the state. In fact, I think the state treasurer said this. He looked at areas that didn't have redevelopment. The tax increment grew by 150 percent or 130 percent, something like that. In areas that had redevelopment, the tax increment grew by over like 230 or 240 percent. So you, this is why the future orientation is important. You may have a short-term increase in tax revenues to get rid of redevelopment. You will have a long-term reduction. Okay, let, let me fast forward. The, the governor gets his way and eliminates redevelopment, uh, which I'm willing to bet is going to happen, just the politics of it. I know you're totally against it, and you're doing everything you can to he's prevent it. said his difficulties so far, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying the governor is going to get his way over the mayor. Not that it's be personal between the two. Don't get yeah. me wrong. I'm not the only one involved in this. You yeah, know yeah, I mean? yeah. The whole state. <laughs> okay. So you as mayor on January, or, or, or this takes effect, you're not going to stop doing economic uh, the redevelopment, even though you, you're going to find ways using the city in different ways to do this. Now, th look, I, I have I have precious little tools and resources now to do economic development. I will have even less um, without redevelopment. And what will happen is it will now start a enormous amount of litigation. There, you just passed Proposition 22, which said the state can't take this money. Uh, Article 16, Section 16 of the Constitution protects this. There, there, there's a pretty clear path that the state can't do indirectly what it can't, what it, what's prohibited from doing directly. So redevelopment funds can only be used for redevelopment purposes. Now you come along, eliminate redevelopment, set up a successor agency, and take the redevelopment funds for something else. It's a pretty clear short-term gain. I think it's going to be a problem. So. I, you're, when you're, that's a good point you're making. You say, well, wait a minute, you're going to eliminate economic development. The truth is, without redevelopment, I have very little in the way of economic development tools to use. And will I be creative and will I try to find three Ps and others? Absolutely. But will it be as robust as redevelopment and as effective? I doubt it. Do you think you're biased because of the experience of Long Beach and Los Angeles, which, I mean, having studied this and looked at this throughout the whole state of California, you guys are mostly great examples of redevelopment working. But there are hundreds of examples where it doesn't work, it, where, it's been, where it's been bad. You know? I wouldn't know if there's hundreds. There are examples of it being abused. New cities that didn't have blight, that used it, you know, some cities that are using it to pay for police and fire. That's really off limits, but that would call, and, and we're in favor, we're in favor of reforming it so that it, you, you have tighter controls, tighter purposes, but the wholesale elimination of this, I think, is a very foolish policy and very short-sighted. You can see it's a complicated issue, but you could just tell by the uh, passion of the uh, council member and, and the mayor that it's a very significant issue that is being faced by cities, and they, and they, have, they have to deal with this. So, If I'm, I may just add, you know, the other thing that we've offered, uh, and, and, and so as the councilwoman mentioned, we know we have to help the state here. I mean, we're, we've, we've put proposals up that what we think would save and provide more money to, to schools and other state purposes than even the governor is proposing with more certainty and less risk of litigation. We have an obligation to try to help out. There's no doubt about that. But you, to go to the, to the point of repeal, we think, is just, just not a very not intelligent but, way to handle this. But from the governor's perspective, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate. The, I thought you were doing that. Okay. <laughs> from the governor's perspective, I see redevelopment from a statewide perspective. And I see city X in the San Gabriel Valley giving tax breaks to company Y so that they could move three miles down the street. Now they're paying less tax, employing the same amount of people. From a statewide perspective, it did not create one new job or anything. But that's a so that, No, that's the enterprise. That, yeah, that's confusing yeah. the enterprise zones 
with right. redevelopment. Right. Enterprise zones But are, they've done that with redevelopment as well. Where it, they well, but if they did do that with redevelopment, then they weren't adhering to the mission or the, the purpose of redevelopment because along with redevelopment, you're supposed to create net new opportunities, not just necessarily... But in the, in the, in the district, not for the state, though. Well, again, you're, you have to make a distinction between an enterprise zone versus, yeah, versus a I, redevelopment. I think there's a confusion there. You're, in redevelopment, what you're doing is taking a, a depressed or blighted area, and you're, you're absolutely creating a better environment and more commercial activity, which helps the state. I think there is a clear on enterprise zones. We, we have a big enterprise zone and, and, and use it well, but I will tell you, to take an enterprise zone, which provides both labor tax credits and investment credits for companies that move into your city. It's the only tool I have to attract business, but to take it, you know, to, to tr attract the business out of Torrance and move it to Long Beach, he's right. Yeah. I mean, the how does the state benefit from that? So we ought to have, if we use enterprise zones, it ought to be only for attracting out-of-state companies into California. So I'm going to have the governor call you tomorrow. Please. And he's Known him for 35 years. I'd be happy to have a conversation with him. He's going to say, It's always amusing. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be convinced about this. I'm getting rid of redevelopment. Okay? But in return, what tool can I give you that would help you in doing the, the things that you would want to do in the city of Long Beach? He'd have to create some financing mechanism to be able to provide the capital improvements and for a partnership in, in areas that need redevelopment. I don't know what that would be. You'd almost have to have a son of redevelopment. And I'm open to looking at that. I think all of us in, in cities are open to looking at that. But thus far, he has been, he's been intractable. He's been where he wants to get rid of it. And as mayor of Oakland, he used redevelopment. Yeah, he did a good job. He's living in a redevelopment apartment in Sacramento, I believe. Yeah. Well, there is talk of a su successor entity uh, to oversee um, money that we encumber uh, that was tax increment for projects that were already in the pipeline. Uh, the configuration of it, though, is heavily skewed towards the county and the school district with only, uh, the proposal only has one seat on it for uh, the city of Los Angeles, and so we're uh, not in agreement with that at this point because it doesn't give us a real voice with money that was generated within our redevelopment areas within our own city. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to the students in a second, and so if they could start thinking about what they might want to ask the uh, Bob Foster, the mayor of Long Beach, and Jan Perry, council member, city of Los Angeles, 9th district, and you heard it here, mayor, mayoral candidate for 2013, and she's going to talk about her strategy in a, li in a, little, in a little while. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to tell it all here on television. That's right. <laughs> But uh, I want to get a, a series of questions about energy that the two of you know quite a bit about in the Department of Water and Power. Um, you are a gubernatorial appointee to ISO. What, what, is, what is that commission? <laughs> so the, it's actually a, it's a public corporation that was set up by through legislation the state is, uh, through the state, which uh, runs the electric market in California. Uh, every day, unbeknownst to most of you, there's a, actually the day ahead, there's a whole market where there's, you know, demand on one side and prices on the other, and they have to equal at some point, uh, and it runs the entire transmission system in the state. Uh, it is a, uh, it is a, as I said, a public corporation, not a state agency, and it's, the responsibility is pretty large, and it also is preparing all the required transmission for the state's renewable policy to have 20% of our electrical resources uh, in renewable energy by 2020 and probably 33% uh, shortly after that. Talk about the energy crisis. You were at Edison and then ask you to talk about how the DWP and the city of LA did during that energy crisis. Uh, must have been a tough time. Yeah, it was really. I I mean, most of the most of the students here were probably ten. So yeah, it was it was in two thousand two thousand and one. So I don't know if there were ten, but it could be. Yeah, uh, and it it was a. I describe it as the movie Groundhog Day for those of you who've seen it. That's what life was like in the energy crisis. I spent in, uh, in Groundhog one, Day is probably that movie's probably even older than they are. Yeah, it probably is, but. <laughs> It's a movie with Bill Murray. Every get up every day and do the same thing. You have the same outcome, and you get up the next morning. It's the same thing again. Which is well, that's classes for them. Yeah. 
It's exactly what it was. I spent 200 days in Sacramento in that period uh, trying to convince the then governor and policymakers to take some action. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I was part of a, I was an executive officer of a company that turned into a nonprofit, and both all the major utilities in the state were on the brink of bankruptcy, and the system was simply failing. And what was happening is you, you, as we found out later and we suspected, you had market participants in a deregulated market uh, that were gaming and abusing the market to, uh, to an unbelievable extent, and it really crashed the system. And the, one of the state's major utilities, PG&E, went into bankruptcy. We avoided it. We were eventually able to work out a, a framework with the Public Utilities Commission that brought the system back to stability and brought the entities back to health. Not before the state of California had actually go out and start buying power because what happened is, and this is where, for those of you studying business, we, we and other companies ran out of the financial capability to borrow money. We went from an A, uh, a, a double A minus company to a C rated company literally in 30 it's days. junk bonds. Yeah, ju below junk bond status, speculative status. And we had no ability to borrow money. Now, you try to buy you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of electrons and you have no credit, pretty darn difficult to do it. So, and, and believe me, the, the governor was warned about this. The state had to step into that role because there was no other entity in the entire state that could fill that role at that point. So it started going out now and buying power on the open market and, and w experiencing the same kind of gaming of the market that we had experienced. And enormous amounts of public resources were spent to be able to finally come out of that and bring the system to stability. Oh, in California, um, SEMPRA down in San Diego, Edison and PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, up in the Bay Area, they provide most of the energy for the uh, state with the exception of the municipals. What percent of the people in California get their energy from those three? Uh, if I remember correctly, it's about, it's about 70 percent. 70 percent. And there was literally times when they weren't getting energy, right? There were blackouts? When you, when you have shortages, what you do is you have what's called rolling blackouts and you shut circuits off for periods of time. And there were rolling blackouts during those periods. And we experienced one here at LMU just a couple of weeks ago, or last week I think it was. But during that whole time, what was happening in the city of Los Angeles? Well, I was elected in 2001, so I can't speak to the level that the mayor can. But I think we're still recovering from the effects of a deregulated environment. As you see us struggle with the Department of Water and Power on the issue of energy conservation, energy efficiency, uh, rebuilding our infrastructure not only for power but for water. Uh, you may recall the subsidence incidents we had last year and the year before where basically parts of the street exploded and water came flying out uh, and affected people's homes and curtailed their, their water usage for a while. Uh, the struggle that we have uh, endured uh, to be able to wean our own customers, our own ratepayers off of coal and move towards renewable energy, but to do it in a way that enables the ratepayer to understand the effects of it, uh, to do it in a competitive way, uh, and to be able to obtain the best rate for the ratepayer. Um, so that's 10 years after, 11, 12 years after, I think we're still recovering from that. Um, but some the, of the, li the lights never went out in LA, though. Yeah, they, well, yeah, they, they've they, gone out. They were, they were, they were really, they were outside the the, the catchment area, the, 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 the service area. No, they were, they were they were not subject to the deregulated market. They were still a municipal utility and still were. And I still want to explain regulated. to the students that. But we have an aging infrastructure. Uh, we have transformers that need to be uh, restored or replaced. Uh, I mentioned our water system uh, uh, has some subsidence issues that we seem to have corrected by staggering the watering schedule. Uh, for water conservation over the last two years. Um, so we still have a lot of work that we have to do, and we have to demonstrate to the ratepayers uh, within our service area that uh, we are spending their money wisely and um, even giving them what they pay for, and still moving them towards, towards the future, uh, which people say they want to do, but we have to explain to them how much it costs and whether or not they can bear that cost. 
and over what period of time. So earlier we were talking about how the airport and the harbor are very successful enterprises or entities run by the city of Los Angeles and the city of Long Beach, and they actually make money, yet they can't transfer that money to the general fund. The Department of Water and Power is different. They can make money, and they in fact do transfer money to the general fund. And so it is actually like a, a company or a business that the city of Los Angeles controls and makes money from that. How, how much money a year do we get from them? Well, we, you know, you may recall we had something called an energy cost adjustment factor last year, which the Department of energy Water... Energy cost a adjustment rate increase, factor. Basically yeah. a rate increase uh, to cover the, the uh, cost of renewables we were investing in. And um, we had a disagreement as to how much that, it's called an ECAF, the rate increase was going to be. Um, and uh, that time, the department historically, which is, they voluntarily transferred whatever surplus they had in their budget to our general fund so that we could balance our budget, withheld that power revenue transfer. It caused our bond rating to drop. And when bond ratings drop, uh, that's very precarious. But can't you order them to give you the money? Well, we, we ultimately did prevail, but it was after much rancor and much debate. But what it caused is a measure which was on the ballot, two measures that, were on the, that was on the ballot this past election, and they both passed. One was to create an Office of Public Accountability with a rate payer advocate to add as, act as a third uh, impartial analyst on behalf of the rate payers to provide government, rate payers, and stakeholders uh, impartial information about the impacts of policy decisions and what they would cost to rate payers. And the second one was the passage of a measure which imposed imposes timelines now that the Department of Water and Power has to comply to inform us as to whether or not they will uh, transfer money uh, to our general fund within a very tight time frame coming from the end of November through the following spring. So as we balance our budget on a quarterly basis, we will know far in advance now whether they intend to make the transfer or not. And if not, they have to substantiate why they're not intending to uh, do that on the public record. Long Beach has a port, an airport. You mentioned a gas distribution system. Why don't you establish your own, energy, your own DWP? <laughs> that hasn't been done in California for a long time. And it, because it's very expensive, uh, you remember, you're, you're, you, what you have to do is purchase another entity's property. So you'd have to... DWP is a, is a fully integrated utility. It, it is as distribution, transmission, and generation. What most cities would do is to buy the existing distribution system of a utility and then go out in the open market and procure electricity. It's expensive to do that. You have to buy all that, and then you have to run the system. I, I will tell you, uh, when I was working with Edison in 1998, I believe, the city of Long Beach embarked on a program because we have our own oil and gas department and we run a gas distribution system, which is far afield and much different from electric system. The gas distribution is basically a large plumbing system. Electricity is a little more complicated. And they embarked on a uh, program to try to purchase the Edison system. And of course now there's a dispute how you value the property. It's a pretty litigious process. And, uh, and one of the questions you always ask is, well, what do you know about electricity? How are you going to run this? Well, the city had hooked up with uh, a very large partner, uh, one of the most admired companies in America at the time, and they were going to partner with this. This company was called Enron. And, well, you, we laugh now, but we, did, we had the benefit of hindsight. Now, we always believed that there was something wrong with the Enron model, and their conduct in the marketplace became more than suspect. Uh, I never understood a company that wanted to be an assetless company. Uh, they eventually succeeded, I might add. They became an assetless company. Uh, I never understood that model. I really, I used to argue with skilling. I don't, I don't get it. You know, what do I know? Uh, but that would have been a disaster for the city. Now we avoided it. We're able, you know, we're able to work out an agreement. San Francisco has come very close. San Francisco has tried to do it like seven or eight times. It requires a vote of the people because you're going to indebt yourself, and it, it is expensive. And it and in today's world, you know, I mean, let me just briefly tell you what's going on 
out in the electron, because I'm close to this now on the ISO. And, you know, I, I was with a company that had the good fortune to have a chairman named Bill Gould in 1982, who happened to also be a Long Beach resident, oddly enough, uh, who established at Edison the fact that we were going to have a renewable policy. 10% of our portfolio was going to be in renewables. Now, in 1882, he was thought of like he's, he's nuts. Now, the, renewable energy is? Solar, wind, geothermal. You don't, most people don't count hydro. DWP does for reasons I don't know why, but most people don't count hydro. It's basically solar, wind, geothermal, and other devices. Hydro's that renewable. The water keeps coming. Yeah, but you don't, we don't do it with dams. Dams are, you know, somehow it, it just became a policy of the state. You could argue it's renewable. I don't deny that. So he established a policy of 10% of the portfolio was going to be renewables, and he, and he began executing that. Now, I came to work for the company in 1984. We actually built on that policy. And when I left, we had nearly 20%. We had more renewables at Edison than any other state in the union, let alone company. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good policy. And you have to, the reason for this is you know, carbon related, it's uh, fossil fuel related, but we, didn't, we, had, we had the Edison at that point had a little bit of coal out of state, now has no coal, or a very small amount, I think. And most of the, and the, the plants at the coast, on the coast were converted from oil to gas, so it's mostly natural gas. And today what's happening, and the reason why the councilman was talking about cost, here's what happens. You're going to now replace with solar, wind, and geothermal a lot of facilities out there, and you're introducing what's called intermittency in the system, because wind doesn't always blow, sun doesn't always shine. Even when it's shining, a cloud comes over and re reduces the impact of, the, of, of solar's production. So you have a lot of intermittency in the system. Now, when you have intermittency, all those other power plants out there that are existing today, mostly gas-fired, and there's plenty of gas in northern, northern North America, have to stay in place to meet that intermittency. Just real simple. If the wind doesn't blow, something has to fill that gap. So you'll save about the, the bottom line on this is you'll probably save 20 or 25 percent of energy, but you're not only going to have to keep what we call capacity, you have to keep all the capacity you have and even add more to be able to keep the system stable. So it's likely to be, that's the most expensive part of the system. It's a capital intense system. So it's likely to, to be more expensive and all of you are gonna have to make a judgment. And we've decided in our generation that it's worth it, it's the right thing to do. You're going to have to decide whether those costs are right, wrong or indifferent and whether that, if maybe there's a, another way to deal with this. If we can find a non-generation way to keep the system balanced and storage is the key, we're not there yet, then I think you, this, this policy will make a great deal of sense going forward. And we're just going to have to be mindful that economics come into play here. So, uh, unlike water, oil, or gas, electricity cannot be stored, and that creates... It, it can be stored only behind dams right now, and there are storage facilities, flywheels, and batteries, which are, are promising but are not commercially uh, viable at this point. We are here at Loyola Marymount University having a conversation with Long Beach Mayor Foster and Council Member Perry from the City of Los Angeles. Uh, I want to thank the Mayor and the Council Member for being here. I know some of you have to get to another class. So very good.